number of individuals have asked to me about my na the nature of my topic and my approach to the topic. And in turn, they shared intriguing bits of information. For example, are you aware that if you want to learn how to cook cuckoo, you can Google it? Just go to Google, key in how to cook cuckoo Barbados, and voila. Or are you aware that you can also go to YouTube where you will find someone there giving instructions? Okay. I spoke with an individual not born in Barbados who did this, and apparently with great success. Her Bajan boyfriend was well pleased. And we know that in this patriarchal society, cooking cuckoo could be a deal breaker in relationships sometimes. However, his sisters instructed her to wet the cornmeal, which was not the instruction on YouTube. And she used a wooden spoon with a spoon, but she's now faithfully promised to go purchase a cuckoo stick when she tries again. And apparently there is a Facebook page with circa 8,000 followers who debate the merits of Bajan food. The hot debate recently was whether we ever put coconut milk in the peas and rice. Though my informant told me she strongly argued no, she was a little surprised to hear yes, <laughs> we did put coconut milk in peas and rice. So food is currently a space in which Bajan identity is actively constructed, demonstrated, debated, and even contested. In cultural studies, we always speak of spaces of contestation, being active, which allow for larger narratives of everyday life to be examined and analyzed. And food tonight is it. And as my remit to examine the development of Bajan cuisine, has been given in that way. I cannot directly and immediately speak to the peas and rice debate, though I will make reference to it. What I will do is focus on select narratives, select because of the dictates of time, as well as some of the cultural practices of food. For as Austin Clark so ably demonstrates in that seminal text, Pigtails and Breadfruit, for one to truly capture the entity that is Beijing cuisine, not only must one focus on the recipes, Clark has strongly argued that when he was growing up in Barbados in the 1930s and early 40s, he never heard the word recipe. The word recipe did not exist in the Barbados of my youth. As a boy, I was surrounded by women, mothers, countless aunts, women, cousins, and all neighborhood women, my friends, my mother's friends, women who were all continuously involved in some confounding and miraculous feat in the kitchen. I never once heard them use the word recipe. Yes, Janelle. You might well ask, how did these women provide the splendor of meals that could be smelled and remembered and yearned for from dis long distances away from their kitchens? In his case, Clark was resident in Canada and he wrote the text well there, so that's really a long distance away from the kitchen. However, his comment brings us to one of the several issues tonight. We now have books of recipes, cookbooks aplenty. The key question is, who writes the recipes? who constructs the meals, who carries out the relevant taste runs, or who carried them out in the past, and who represents this process. And especially in the early days, were the cooks who were mostly African Barbadian represented or acknowledged? Were their skills noted? What we would now call intellectual property, was their intellectual property observed? There are many silences in the cookbooks and a number of guesstimates as to what is Bajan, as a perhaps against Barbadian, but I'll get to that, as well as a few recipes that would be more at home on the tables of the continent of Europe. But more of this as we proceed. First, I must pay tribute, for this is a lecture on Bajan food, and this lady must be acknowledged. Food comes first. Come cook with us the Bajan way, let's eat what we grow, Karamita would say, or grow what we eat, provide vegetables and meat. Now this little ditty was written for a supplement on Bajan cooking published by The Advocate, and this was the poet's way of honoring Karamita. You can show, this is a young Karamita, isn't it? Thanks to the Barbados Government Information Service. I have many slides from the Barbados Government Information Service, so let me publicly thank them. Food comes first, eat what we grow, and grow what we eat. Singular chants of the 1970s, 80s, into the 90s. These chants can be treated as war cries in the battle of what was seen as Bajan cuisine, 
in the fight to determine what was appropriate for the table representing Barbados food culture. Yam and sweet potato, the food of the working class and poor, at the time was deemed unsuitable. Note the observation of Edward Cumberbatch in the prefix of the text, National Directory of Recipes, compiled by Carmita. So many Caribbean housewives give the impression in the presence of others that they are apologizing for local cuisine. The many we use to impress others, especially locals like ourselves, must reflect a foreign flavor. And so often what the guests really would like to try is cuckoo, put in themselves, jug jug, peas and rice, chew or bakes. And he said that in 1976. And I cannot help but note the irony that in the 21st century, where we're all bombarded with advice on healthy eating, on what are good carbs and empty carbs, what are we now told to eat? Sweet potato and yam. Carmita was spot on. Food does indeed come first. Hence, tonight's lecture is structured as follows. We are looking into the pot. Who represents Beijing cuisine and is there a guiding philosophy? I've kind of begun that discussion and I'll be carrying it through as I go on. Early years, of ens early years and years of enslavement and the evolving cuisine that came out of that period of time. Are they in or out of the pot? Some are in, some are out. There's a book that came out in World War II called Wartime Recipes, and I'll examine that. Then there's the Housecraft Center, which is a cultural institution on its own. And then hopefully I will get the time to talk to cookbooks and cuisine. And initially I had the title as Three Women and One Man. So hopefully some of you will work out who the three women would be. I'm working closely with Janelle because I have many slides I want to illustrate um, aspects of the lecture, so at some point in time, this might be tossed aside as I go on. Thank you. Next slide. There's an article, and that's the title, Arawa, African and English Settlers on Barbados, the Origins of Bajan Food. It's online. There's an article that speaks to the merit of Bajan food and proposes that its underlying narrative is British and that Bajan food has British pedigree. To reach this conclusion, the article, though appearing to be all-encompassing, that's a broad title, focuses only on the 17th century and blatantly omits any text published after 1972. For my historian friends in the audience, it stops at Brindon Ball and Brindon Ball, whose discourse in many ways is very Eurocentric. Hence, the emphasis of the article, though it claims to be all-encompassing, is placed on the early years of settlement, especially on Ligon, who single-handedly, it is claimed, taught all of the island how to survive. That quote at the bottom is actually from Brindenbaugh and Brindenbaugh. Further, the article pays little attention to foods such as yam, sweet potato, edos, etc. It also states that there was little flying fish, so herrings, etc., is emphasized. It even speaks to a banquet held by Colonel Drax, which featured foods that he had not flown in, shipped into Barbados, and pronounces that Bajan food at this time is tropical English. And through a feat akin to performing a quantum leap, the writer leaps from the 17th to the 20th century and embraces select passages of Clark, pigtails and breadfruit, I'll be showing you some, emphasizes that pigs, which is so central to Barbadian cuisine, were brought in by the Europeans, Peas were brought from the British, and that the soup that Clark speaks of is recognizable even though it has quote-unquote humble island fare. Much can be said about the article, but time does not allow it. I do want to highlight the presence of this continuing narrative of Britishness that succeeds in stifling, marginalizing, misrepresenting, and in many ways straight-jacketing the culture and identity of Barbados. I thus ask, what of the process of creolization, the process of the blending of cultural practices to create the new, to create the Caribbean Creole foods? What of the contribution of the enslaved Africans and their descendants to the culture of food? Often the cookbooks do speak of the Af Arawak, European, and African heritage, and usually in that order of preference, because it's not alphabetical. Moreover, many of the battles that have been fought and won in historiography are not reflected in the discourse in the cookbooks. 
thus misleading the reader and misrepresenting the process of cultural change. This article ignored 40 years of writing. Note also this passage which comes from another cookbook. As early as the middle of the 17th century, historians recorded that Barbadians were very partial to their food and drink, consuming sumptuous meals and imbibing much beer, Madeira, and other important wines, sangria, a Madeira-based punch dates back to the early days. Now, the middle of the 17th century, it can be argued that the enslaved were Africans and not Barbadians, so there's not an intention to exclude them in the construct of being Barbadian. But the passage does start with the word from. So the descendants of Africans would be included. And for clarity, very few people, including poor whites or the lower class whites, would have had, um, enjoyed sumptuous meals with much Madeira and beer. But it's misleading. And it kind of follows through the thought of tropical English. Consequently, the following section of the lecture, the first section, pays special attention to the foods of the enslaved, but also notes food choices and meals of other groups on the plantations. Note will also be made for the period of enslavement, and sometimes in that period we have no more than hints as to how the foods were actually prepared, as European observers were not really interested in the enslaved, and even more their eating habits and meals. Occasionally we do note a meal, as for the example of conkeys. The section that follows entitled Involving Cuisine in and out of the pot does seek to note ways in which some of the foods might have been prepared. And this is where Janelle and I will be in constant contact. The first slide. So, no, go back please. Yes, right. So in the 17th century, we note presence of plantain, pigeon peas, boiled yam, roast guard, pone, you can read it. In the 18th century, definitely yams, pigeon peas, pumpkins out of calabashes. Next slide. So Dixon speaks especially to pigeon peas, which is very much part of our diet. Um, can you go back? Given to pigeons, well, he says that, um, um, that no good, for, good food for men and by many white people are preferred to any kind of European peas. Remember the article says the Europeans brought in the pea, but now we have here that the Europeans are eating. As would happen with the process of creolization, everything is being shared on the plantations. Yeah. Okras, says Dixon, are the vegetables, but note, the enslaved are not allowed butcher's meat, milk, butter, any kind of fresh animal, sometimes flying fish is given instead. I have to thank Dr. Anthony Richards for pointing this out to me, that Hughes speaks of other items. I can't identify these, he can, I don't know if he's in the audience. So the papa okra was boiled as salad, and eaten mostly by the enslaved. The rata pepper, rata okra, and ho ho, made by our slaves in their soups and broths, who esteem not justly, it's a wholesome boiled salad, so we know they're having soups and broths and what's going in it. And gumma bush, I've been in contact with Dr. Rita Pemberton, and in Tobago, gumma bush was consumed right up to the end of the 19th century. I am told it can still be seen growing in some places in Barbados. It's what we would, Barbadians might call bush. We no longer can identify these things, but Hughes is showing us that these items were consumed by everyone. Yeah, please. There is the mobi, which initially was made of sweet potato, and there's this practice of the enslaved women selling mobi, as we know happens continuously in the 19th and the 20th century. Then Dixon speaks of horse beans and flour, but frequently they have edos and sweet potatoes and sometimes yams and plantains, the allowance of which also some small quantities of salted beef and pork. So we're getting an idea, an idea of what the foods would be. Beef, salted beef, when I was growing up, your rice must have salt beef in it or it must have some pork in it, pigtails, etc. So there's, there's a food, a, evolving, cuisine that's evolving, coming from what was limited at the time, yeah. Then there's the can't see stones. Dixon, and I was speaking with Professor Cheng Odiambo today, and he was saying in Kenya, these two round stones, you put the corn between them and you rub. This is before the advent of, of mills that some plantations provided. So this everyday meal was the rubbing of the corn into flour. 
Also then Hughes points out that they would, the corn then was made into bread, which was very wholesome. But Robert Poole provides the greatest clue. He observed a sort of uniform cake called conkeys, and wrapping it up in plantain or banana leaves, bake it in the oven or otherwise as they can, and feed upon it either alone or with what else they can get. And he actually said sometimes pumpkin is on the plate, sometimes there are other items actually on the plate. If you go to Antigua, Dukuna is served with the meal. There's a practice, and I have no idea how it evolved, that conkeys then became the festival food, particularly for Guy Fawkes Day. And then with independence, it was transferred then to independence itself. And in recent times, Supercent and everyone else sells it all through the year. But <laughs> we do know that as early as the 18th century, we actually see the word conkeys, and it comes right through. There are a few recipe books which claim that conkeys came from the Arawaks, but individuals like Maureen Warner Lewis will speak of the taxonomy of cooking of the continent of Africa. It involves a lot of steam. And therefore, as you go through different islands, Dukana Trinidadians have Pemi, blue drawers in Jamaica. You have this food that shows up and where it manifests, it might have an ingredient or not. For example, Dukana does not have pumpkin. Well, so the Antiguans look at our conky and go, and mom is here saying something, no meal. <laughs> no meal in Dukana. No meal in Dukada. So no meal, and so they look for us as Barbadians, what's happened. But you can see the sweet potato, and it has a kind of gray kind of, sorry? I'm being instructed, sweet potato, coconut, and flour. Well, ours must have some pumpkin in there and currants and stuff. <laughs> Next slide, please, Janelle. Right, so what I want to quickly track for this first period of examination is what has evolved and what is in or out of the pot. And we know salted cod is going to be there and we know salted beef. Flying fish, Professor Welch did a sterling lecture on the maritime history of food, but I just want to point out that we do have instances where observers see fry flying fish for sale. Maria, he, he's writing a text as a sailor and the women came up to the ship with the flight frying fish. There's also an observation by a Methodist preacher that the enslaved ate flight frying fish on planting leaves. So that's how it was originally served. Remember, these are the days of no plates and spoons. It'll be calabash, etc. And I just picked up an observer from the 1955 who thought the sterling thing about Barbados was a sharply flavored flying fish. So we'll have many flying fish recipes. Let's go, first one. A Bajan cookbook comes out, it's called The Bajan Cookbook, published by the Child Care Committee in 1964, and they have many recipes for saltfish. But I want to focus on this. This is Privilege. The title of the book by Errol Walton Barrow, Mr. Lee. And please observe, you can see the ingredients. Salt, saltfish, okra, seasoning, onions, peppers, peppers, Cut it all up, privilege. Um, Honorable Errol Walton Barrow said he deliberately named the book Privilege as he traveled from house, house to house in St. John. This would be the food offered to him as he came for a meal. You have the privilege to have saltfish. So, privilege. And I think even in today's time, even more so, the price of saltfish alone was sent. You <laughs> really do. <laughs> But it's very central, and, and I'm bringing Clark in so we have a cultural now ring to what we're talking about, please. Clark, I need to spot this. When you survey the contents of that pot, after you have taken off the lid and opened she up, such a waft of historical and cultural goodness going to blow in your face. Such a reminder from the slave days, such a powerful smell of Barbadian hot cuisine is going to greet you that your mouth is bound to spring water and salivate in a contemporaneous salvation of salivation. Austin Clark, pigtails, inbred fruit. He does say, and I agree with him, if you just speak to the recipe, you miss the entire construct of what is the cuisine. Let's say such a thank you. Now we visit the flying fish. And the Beijing cookbook, those are some of the recipes. Next slide. And those are some of the recipes. 
So there are many recipes, and many books have recipes, but I want to highlight this particular image. I believe it's a really Allen image. Rita Springer's book was republished in 2007 by Miller, and this is the cover. And it's a superb picture, isn't it, of steam flying fish. It, it looks like you could just reach and eat it just there. So I'm back to Clark. Now Clark says that he remembers when he was a boy, the women would walk the village and they'd be calling, come and get my fish, fish here, all a penny. During these all a penny evenings, my mother would buy three dozen for the price of one shilling. Before I went to bed that night, the fish would be cleaned, scaled, gutted, cleaned a second time, soaked in lime juice and salt, seasoned and fried or steamed, and my mother and I would eat them all. <laughs> Flying fish, <laughs> all a penny. <laughs> I, I like the process, you can see it happening, and I grew up with that when you were, you know, it was really a labor intensive moment of scaling, cleaning, boning, etc. Janelle, thank you. Now, Nathaniel Weeks, he writes of seafood, I want to highlight. The firm fish conch is not devoid of friends, nor crayfish soup with that of Wilkes can vie. The turtle's merit is beyond compare, and sea eggs fresh is luxury itself. Before you move, um, sea eggs, in another 20 years, maybe it will just be a memory, won't it be? I remember sea eggs wrapped in grape leaves. Um, so this is the 70s, leaving primary school with my mom, and we go through the bus stand, and there's a heap of sea eggs and frizzled sea egg. Um, Wilts and crayfish soup. There was a discussion just a couple of weeks ago at the back of fishing Wilts in the waters in St. Andrew in the Scotland district, and crayfish, crayfish. But I really want to focus on the turtle. Thank you. Next slide, Janet. Now, the turtle was very much in Beijing cuisine. It um, constantly consumed, apparently. In the Lascelles papers, there's a reference in 1800 where two green turtles were sent up for Lord Hayward's table. I'm told there was a cultural practice of engaging the turtle. Barbadians talk about engaging the pig. Anyone, anyone saw Alleluia pork chops? That was an excellent example of engaging the pig. Usually, the pig has five or six legs promised out in his one pig. So apparently, there's this cultural practice of engaging the turtle. You, you walk the village and say, I have a turtle. What do you want? Do you want the fin, etc., etc.? And some ladies in the museum were actively discussing that you marinated the turtle in rum so that it wouldn't be too tough, or in lime and salt. So I have a question. Turtle, gone from the pot. These are some of the recipes I've seen in the books. There's apparently the ocean view turtle soup was outstanding, so as I've put ocean view there, but turtle eggs were eaten, turtle fin was eaten, turtle steaks were eaten, turtle stew was eaten, and Nathaniel Weeks spent at least five verses discussing how to kill a turtle, which I thought of sharing with you, but frankly I was so revulsed about it. But it's gone. Has anyone here eaten turtle? Oh, hands up, wonderful. I'm told that there may be still some consumers of turtle. I don't want hands for that. This would be an illegal activity now. But turtle definitely was in the pot. Thank you. Next slide. And Clark, and this question of just not the food, but the appropriateness of the food for the meal. So I'm just sharing this here with you, with his view of dolphin. Let us take dolphin, for instance. Dolphin, when boiled and cut up in pieces, was not considered proper to be served on a Sunday. Dolphin fried with a slight covering of batter or flour and seasoned deeply with thyme, black pepper, fresh from the tree, ginger eschalots was, on the other hand, regarded as fairly proper for a Sunday table. This is the 1930s and 40s, and the seasoned deeply is important. Barbadians make an incision my Caribbean friends were stunned when I'm there. I'm in the UK, cutting up the chicken, and they said, no, ma, see, you're supposed to rob the, yeah, but no, we are, we make a decision. And I have one more observation before I move on. Mutton and Eddowes and pigtails. From Clark, 
Mutton soup boy with the edos, the boiling edos, as we were saying, Beijing, not the pulp edos. Witching is for cooking with dried food. Mutton soup with edos and parts of the sheep head, witching we used to get from Mr. Whitaker, and flavor from the salt pig tail, witching we used to get from Miss Edward's shop. You used to like your salt pig tails. <laughs> Remember what we had in our brief review of the enslaved period, they're not being actually fed the meat. It's the entrails, it's the bits and pieces, so that the food evolves reflects that. So the mutton soup is not the mutton itself, but the head. Again, hands, everyone has ever eaten this incredible meal of mixtures? Some hands up, a few staring. <laughs> Thank you. Just a few images to, as a transition from the end period of enslavement, emancipation into World War II. Thank you to the Barbados Museum and Historical Society. The market scene, and we have another market scene, both from the 1900s, Subtle Street. Still very much an active market today. So I'm going to catch up with my papers, maybe. World War II. I saw three ships a sailing, but not with food for me, for I am eating homegrown foods to beat the enemy, and ships are filled with guns instead to bring us victory. Francis Chandler would have presented the lecture on the wartime provisions. I hope you've been. So I'll just speak to a bit of the recipes. I won't overlap with Francis. The war brought severe cultural change to Barbados, especially re eating patterns and cuisine. Rice was no longer coming in as readily as before, as Francis would have explained. And indeed, we found that it was rationed. I spoke to Dame Patricia Simmons, and she said, yes, it was rationed, but rice still had to be eaten on a Sunday. Your peas and rice was a Sunday meal. So you would save the rice for peas and for the Sunday. The Department of Science and Agriculture then published a series of recipes in The Advocate that emphasized the use of local foods, for example, in 1942, they published recipes on the cassava. So, Grow More Food Campaign, recipes for cassava, cassava and gingerbread, cassava and lemon, cassava donuts, cassava cookies, cassava biscuits, cassava oat cakes, cassava beets, white wheat flour, cassava muffins. They also published recipes on the sweet potato, 30 recipes on the sweet potato. I've just selected a few for you. Leonized sweet potatoes. You can see that some of the British recipes, the European recipes are being creolized to suit. Um, and if you thought sweet potato chips were just invented, Barbadians were eating them in 1942. Next slide, Jeanette. Yes, stuffed pineapples, orange sauce, sweet potato pone, Georgian style, apparently you put two tablespoons of molasses. I have no idea what that tastes like. Pumpkin and sweet potato fritters, sweet potato dumplings, sweet potato omelets, sweet potato muffins, and you made a sweet potato crust. 30 recipes for sweet potato. If, if we ever get bombed again, or you just know where to go back, we go back to the sweet potato. Now, as part of the war effort, the wives of a number of prominent white, mainly white and colored elite, formed an association to raise funds for the troops and other needs for the war. They called themselves the Voluntary War Workers Association. They organized fairs, carnivals, cake sales, etc. They even had a, what they call a country committee with members from 10 parishes. I'm still wrestling with that. St. Michael was excluded, so apparently all of the parishes in Barbados except St. Michael was seen as the country in 1942. Can we have the slide, please? So six years, the Voluntary War Workers Association, the patrons were both governors, Waddington and Bush. There were country committees, knitting committees, they knitted gloves, they knitted mine gloves for, for the troops if they're having to scrape off to find mines. The entertainment committee was very active. There were the rationing committees. Dame Simmons says, yes, her mom worked on the rationing committee. You would ration the amount of rice, etc." And apparently her mom said, if you came to her as a friend, you had to wait like everyone else to receive your portion of rice. But then in 1942, a committee pops up called the Com Cooking Demonstration Committee. And they hold many demonstrations. There are over 50 demonstrations held in a six-year period. 
they hold a, they're held at the exhibition, the Agriculture Exhibition, right here in Queen's Park at the Girls Industrial Union. And the chairwoman was Mrs. Arthur. The ladies are named after their husbands. This is good old patri uh, patriarchy here. Mrs. St. Johnson, but I know her name, she was the vice chair. And then there were three members of the committee. Mrs. H.G. Cummings, whose granddaughter is sitting here. Mrs. F.A. Bishop and Mrs. Mahon, whom I still haven't discovered who Mrs. Mahon is, but, ah, Francis Maud, Maudie Mahon, Molly Mahon, the, the hunt continues. They then published a cookbook called Wartime Recipes. And I don't remember who did this illustration, but it was deliberately done. The individuals who contribute to the cookbook are not really in any way an ethnic appearance of the individual here on the cover. Although there might be occasions where the name of the individual is put against the recipe, it's possible. But this is a 1942 image. I mean, the artists are here staring at it. We do actually get the coal pot. <laughs> Let's call it that. Please go. Mrs. Hudson, her name is K.E. Hudson. She says in the prefix, I have compiled this recipe book with the idea of assisting housekeepers during the present conditions when it is not always possible to obtain the things we were accustomed to use. So I have not put in any extravagant recipes. I have tried to use recipes containing as far as possible only local products. I, that was an ad. Bovril puts beef into everything. <laughs> So this is actually the ad in the 1942 recipe book. And I'll keep showing you some ads um, as we go on. So I've selected a few recipes to show the individuals. Hopefully someone here might be able to recognize some of them. You have fried shark, Mrs. Miss Arthur, Miss Evelyn. Uh, many recipes were contributed by Miss S. Evelyn. Mrs. Bowring of Bowring Elite fame. Yes, she, uh, curry recipe and yam turnovers. Yam turnovers, an interesting thought, Janelle. Then we have sheep's head pastry from the Ministry of Food. One sheep's head parsley nut, nutmeg onion pastry bake. That's basically what the recipe said. <laughs> Mayonnaise from Mrs. Boring. Um, Edo patties. What a thought. Breadfruit meat pudding, Reverend Cooper. It's very active. Do you, I don't know if you know of a Reverend Cooper, but he, at least three recipes were by, submitted by him to the book. And I had to include this. Barbados rum omelette. Essentially, you make the omelette as an omelette. Then, you cool for a few seconds, then spread on the inside some guava jelly. Roll like a sausage and put onto a hot dish. Pour over it two tablespoons of good Barbados rum, set on fire, and serve while burning. <laughs> <laughs> Call the fire service. Meanwhile, <laughs> but it's very much like bananas. Huh? The, 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 you, you set rum on bananas, etc. But something to think about. Not sure what it would taste like. <laughs> well, someone will be burnt. Yes. But I want to focus on the two ladies in the cooking demonstration committee. Oh, these recipes, these are some of the examples of the recipes in the book which do not have a name attached to them. So this is my question, whose recipes are these? They're not um, British or European in any way. These are African Barbadian recipes. It's highly possible that these are the cooks themselves in the household that have been asked to contribute. So notice, Breadfruit cuckoo, cornmeal cuckoo, mammy apple jam, nice. Pumpkin and sweet potato fritters, sorrel jam. Carmita did sorrel jam, but mammy apple jam sounds interesting. Mrs. H.G. Cummings, thank you Cummings family for this photo, wife of the premier who will become the premier of Barbados, Mr. Hugh Gordon Cummings. And the grand mom of Alessandra sitting here at the front. So the Volunteer War Workers Committee, mainly the white elite, but prominent members of the colored elite. In the book, Better Lasting Than Bronze by Miss Simmons, she writes of Miss Cummings, 
Besides being an excellent imaginative cook and pastry maker, she was skilled in hat making, hairdressing, floristry, dressmaking, basketry, and cake icing. Apparently, she could repair chairs as well and cane them. From the family, I'm told that she was known for her wedding cake, cakes, and she was very particular about them. That was an email. She taught home economics at the Housecraft Center, which we will speak to. She also worked at the welfare clinic, had many, many jobs, um, fed, taught mothers how to breastfeed, etc. Mrs. F.A. Bishop is actually Mrs. Frank Bishop, but her name is Edna Marie Bishop. She eventually becomes the guiding commissioner, and again, this is from the book by Mrs. Simmons. So these re the recipes that these ladies contributed to the cookbook, orange layer cake, orange frosting and orange cookies from Mrs. Cummings, egg fruit with cheese, I'm not sure what that would be, um, corn gems also from Miss Bishop using one cup of corn flour. So this is a cooking demonstration committee, and so there is a cookbook that is published and apparently used beyond the war. They did raise some funds. I do not know what was the price of the cookbook, but they were raising funds, and I'm now reading that it was sold right through the 50s into the 60s. And some of the recipes were then incorporated into the Child Care Committee's cookbook of 1964. How do I know this? Guess, guess which guess the recipe that's included in the Child Care Cookbook. Barbados Rum Omelet. Pour rum, set on fire. That's, <laughs> that's in the cookbook, the 1964 cookbook. Thank you. And I must return to peas and rice, and I must return. Now, Dame Simmons says that definitely peas and rice were eaten. Rice was still consumed, those who could acquire rice. So I thought, let's do a cultural visit to the culture of peas and rice. Have them in someone who picked rice. Younger generations don't do this anymore. On each Saturday night in every Barbadian home was the ritual of picking rice. You use your index finger and the thumb of the same hand like an electric counter to pick out the weevils or weevils, specks and husks, dead, dried worms and diminutive skeletons of insects. Janelle's face is amazing. To, she, you, you have no idea of picking rice. Yeah, she's a what? But the cultural aspect is interesting. Picking rice was also a social event. A boy lucky enough or old enough to be courting was invited to the girl's home on a Saturday night. While courting, he would pick rice. By the chance that toes and feet and knees might touch onto the table that bore the mountains of rice. <laughs> now Clark makes it very clear that the senior individual in the house remains in the room and more or less instructs the young man to pick the rice. So it's kind of an understanding. You can have a little toesies under the table, but you've got to pick this rice. <laughs> Thank you. A third section is the Housecraft Center. I now turn to the Housecraft Center, an important Barbadian cultural institution. The center can be seen as foundational to modern Bajan cuisine as many girls and women and their daughters and their nieces, etc., attended the center. Many of the teachers of home economics taught the upcoming teachers of home economics who taught in the schools. I was taught by Mrs. Mildine Messiah, for example. It was also seen as an activity going to the housecraft centers. One lady said to me, what else was there to do in those days? This lady worked during the day and attended the evening classes of the housecraft center. We will also see the, tonight the notebook of Amise Vivian Lucas, who took evening classes in 1958. She has kept her exercise books. And just today I met someone whose mother attended the center in the 1960s, while she attended the branch, the branch of the center in Parkinson Field. There was one in Richmond and in Parkinson Field. Both she and her mother have kept their certificates. And she too has her exercise book of recipes and she promised me she would bring them tonight. Have you brought them? Marva? Wave it. Where's the exercise book? This is Marvel, who was at the University of West Indies, filled with recipes written <laughs> when she attended the Housecraft Center. So first up, how many of you know someone who attended the Housecraft Center? How many of you attended the Housecraft Center? Keep your hands up. So know someone, hands up. 
and went to the house of Francis is saying, she went to the house of Francis. Anyone else? You have your notebook. Anyone else has their notebook? This is a, we have work to do history. <laughs> there are these notebooks to be gathered. My mother attended the House Craft Center, and I believe she probably very early in the early 50s, and I remember she said to me that her family was appalled. This was embarrassing. A good middle class lady goes off to the House Craft Center. My godmother attended the House Craft Center in 1960, and so some of the information I receive is, comes from her. And a lady who was my grandmother figure, Mrs. Morrison, Miss Morrison, taught at the Housecraft Center in Richmond. So the Housecraft Center is a very major institution. So first we can look at the building. Can go back to the building, please. The building is still standing today. It's on the grounds of Bethel, Bethel Church. Um, if you go to Bethel and turn to, you go in, drive into Bethel, you turn to your right, the building is there. The sign now says electrical company, government electrical engineering. But this, it's the same building. It's the same building. Yes. Definitely funds to set up the Housecraft Center came from the Colonial and Development Welfare Act of 1940. And it officially opened to the public. They, they had a, what you might call a soft opening before. Officially opened to the public on the 16th of September. And they ran six-month courses for students from the Windwards and the Leewards. And the countries of Montserrat, Dominica, St. Vincent, these students then took the City and Guilds course. And as a matter of fact, the center ran courses from the City and Guilds. This lady, I have spent a long time looking for an image of this lady. I've asked the family, no one can find an image. I publicly thank the public library. They were literally just going through a books on who's who in Barbados. This is Ivy Alley. Has anyone ever heard of her? Yeah, very much a stalwart of the Hartscraft Center. Um, we have a slide. Her name is mentioned as part of the team for the cooking demonstration committee of 1942. She was a domestic science teacher and she trained in domestic science. I hope you were able to read the image there. In the FAO report of 1954, she's named as the organizer of the Housecraft Center. I am told she was a strict disciplinarian and she was seen as an independent lady because in the 1950s she had a car and drove herself. Um, <laughs> She was assisted by Miss Sinclair Morrison, who I publicly admit was my grandmother figure, and I believe a distant family of Miss Cubbins as well. And a Mrs. Rose, Miss Sinclair Morrison, was the headmistress of St. Matthias Primary School. So my English was impeccable when I was growing up, as you would imagine. And she taught at the Richmond branch. I am actively trying to discover more information on Ivy. She seems to have fallen out of the writing and Hopefully we can do a project and revive her memory. The FAO made a very lengthy report of the Housecraft Center in 1954, and I've just included a couple of things. The primary objective of home economics education should be the improvement of individual and family life. To achieve this, home economics courses must deal with every aspect of life in the home, including the house and its equipment, food for the family, the care of the children in the home, management of economic and other resources in the home. That's right. So going to the Housecraft Center, you can choose the course you wanted to pursue. My mother pursued um, the cooking course. Francis, what did you do at the cooking course? Many ladies did laundry. I think the ladies there with the, the exercise, but you did the cooking course and what else, Marva? Care for the elderly. I, I do have some images. Uh, thanks again to the Barbados Government Information Service. A number of things. There, sometimes it's called housewifery, or there's also butlering being taught. So, full time classes, if you could afford to go to the center full time. But many individuals I've spoken to speak of the evening classes. Food preservation, definitely, and food and cookery with nutrition. For example, I have a very clear memory of my mom making guava jelly. I now understand having done this. Guava jelly, large saucepans in the kitchen, 
heaps and heaps of guavas that I would try to eat before she could actually have a chance to stew them. And then jars and jars of guava jelly. That was the everyday experience, which is no, we, we buy the jar from, I wouldn't do any product, call, product name calling, but you buy the jar from the shelf, but that was what was done. Slide please, Janelle. So, several, several recipes listed by the FAO, but the first recipe struck me, milk and biscuits, which as many of you would know, was one of the reasons the Housecraft Center was set up. The nutritional, there was concern about the nutritional contents of food for children going up for the working class. But this was the first recipe, milk and biscuits, boiled egg and sandwiches. Today, someone asked me, why egg? But if you go through the cookbooks, eggs are practically in every meal. It's a source of protein. So you would, an egg would be on the plate. That was a practice that has died out now. Beef cutlets. But because I have actual recipe, I want to show you, please. Miss Lucas made these notes on the 20th of January, 1958. Tea, bread, and butter. Per table, two teaspoons. Can you see it? All right, so I will let you read it. I don't need to read it for you. Basically, it's tea. You make the tea. Read it? Oh, wow, okay. Two teaspoons of tea, 10 teaspoons per side. Sugar to test, third cup milk, three and a half cups milk to third cups water. Method, bring water to the boil, use at once, then the pot, warm the pot and put in tea. Immediately the water boils, pour to tea cover, pour to tea cover and allow to infuse for three to five minutes. Train tea and serve. Second recipe, macaroni pie. So macaroni pie was being taught in the Housecraft Center in 1958. It's been around for a long time. Again, now, now this one is faded. It's 1958 and the pen wasn't as strong, but the recipe is as we know it. Um, someone I showed today commented on the slicing of tomatoes to put on top of the rec macaroni. This was someone of the young in her 30s. She'd never seen that. Slice it. I see some nodding of heads. Yes, slice the tomatoes. Um, this dish may be garnished with hard boiled egg. She says, why would you put hard boiled egg on a macaroni? But there's a cultural practice of putting egg on everything and slices of tomato. Then there's a menu written on the 3rd of February, 1958. Vegetable soup beef cutlets, macaroni pie, pawpaw, vegetable soup, potatoes, onions, salt, the usual pepper, breadfruit is in there, cut vegetables into dice and cook. I, even I can't make up. <laughs> put in the, oh, butter, put in butter in a few minutes, add bacon, short, then stock and bouquet garni. Um, Boil until vegetables are tender, remove potato which has not been dried, diced, this has not been diced, add milk, season to taste, boil gently for another three minutes and serve. These are very workable recipes. <laughs> thank you, Miss Lucas, mum of Lynn Lucas of Government Information Service. So thank you, Lynn. So as a researcher, this is wonderful. And I said, I said to Marva today, and she says, yes, I still have my cookery book, so perhaps in the discussion period you can read, read a recipe out for us from your book. Yes, Marva? Thank you. Next slide, Janelle. So these are now some images of what was done at the center. And this is, as someone pointed out, this is not um, spray starch, this is arrowroot starch, ball starch, because these doilies are stiff. This was learned, I see, I see some nodding of heads, this was learned at the center, taught at the center. This is the 1970s, there was an exhibition, so notice there are these signs up, caring for the family's health, breastfeed your baby, eat foods from each group daily. The center is very much into teaching about the nutrition and cuisine. We fight germs and keep away illness. So a picture speaks a thousand words. Points to ponder from local food products. Next slide. The 25 year service of the Housecraft Center. What struck me, look at the length of these skirts. We complain now of the, the what is it, the, the dress of the young generation. Well, those are some mini dresses there. <laughs> but these two ladies. Now, um, yes, you can go to the next slide. Now, it's interesting, I don't know if you can read the signs, but Conky is involved in everything on that plate. 
the loaf, this loaf, conky bread with cornflakes sprinkled on top. Conky cake with golden apple jam. The conkies are here. And that's why I said conkies and varieties. But also notice the nutritional value, the sign at the back that speaks to the nutritional value of chicken, etc., pumpkin, barley. Slide again, please. This is a shot of the kitchen with someone busy cooking. And yes, the preserves, um, Housecraft Center specialize in bottling preserves, so there are the preserves there on display, and these lovely food covers that all of us grew up with. I don't know if you're around anymore. Um, that's actually a shot of the icing. So, this is an ice cake, and these are um, bowls of icing, but we couldn't get the, the image didn't come out as strongly as the others, so, but at least you have that, yes. And, a presentation, but I recognize this gentleman. Canon Harold Tudor. Reverend Tudor is on the stage, whilst presentations are being made. Yeah. And, yeah. If even if you go to the electrical company, the electrical engineering space now, there is still a very large tree. So the practice was that the food would be sold under the tree, and this is um, an example where patrons are coming in from the outside and they're actually buying the products of the Housecraft Center. And this is a graduating class of the Housecraft Center. Um, hopefully at some stage you'll be able to identify individuals in the photo. There is a nun there, so perhaps we can start with her. Thank you. Thank you, museum, for this shot of Busby Alley, painting of Ivan Payne, yes. <laughs> Next slide. Finally, as we zoom along, I hope I'm not taking too much time, I just want to note some of the cookbooks that we've studied and, and look at some more. There's the Beijing cookbook. It was first published in 1964. The preface was written by Lady Stowe, governor, the wife of the governor. And in 1961, the preface was written by Lady Scott, wife of the then governor, um, published by the Child Care Committee. Unfortunately, that's all the information that we have. I, I have no names of who compiled it. I do not know where the recipes came, originated, but I do know that some were put in from the wartime recipes. Then in 1968, there's that seminal cookbook by Rita Springer. We'll speak more on that. There's also the Barbados cookbook, which I think has had several editions. I believe this is the one by Sorder and Hamilton. There's Privilege by Barrow and Lee. And there's, I could not determine the date of this publication, Francis. So I know it's in 2000 and some, but I couldn't actually see a date in the text of when it was published. Homestyle Recipes from Cooks in Barbados. An interesting title because, in a sense, it's, saying, it's indicating that the recipes in the book may or may not be called Bajan, but all of the cooks who have put the book together have come from Barbados. So that covers that. And I want to, to um, devote a slide separately to Carmita. Carmita did not publish a book per se, although the National Recipe, Recipe Directory is a fairly thick covered book, a number of pamphlets. So in 1981, there's the food first, come cook with us the Bajan way. I've also seen um, editions of that book without the words food first. There's a small pamphlet, Eating the Bajan Way, and then there's an, another pamphlet, Fruits the Beauty Fires. Also, as I was reminded, she would publish her recipes in The Advocate, so there are several publications around of Carmita's recipes. Yeah. So this is the image of the 1964 version, thank you. The museum library did have it, so it was a pleasure to see. Intriguing what was thought, what they thought to put, the wooden spoon, etc., the whisk, yeah. And I had to include an advert. Does anyone remember? Sun Valley butter? <laughs> Sun Valley butter, another one. Libby's makes the ketchup. Now, I had a comment today that's spelled incorrectly. Ah, no, we've forgotten that there was an older way of spelling the word ketchup, as against ketchup. So Libby's, yeah, thank you. And so I'll start with Rita Springer. Basil sent this image to me. We've seen her, the newer version of her cookbook before, the flying fish cover. 
Rita taught at the Housecraft Center. She taught a number of places, but her claim to fame is that she is, she was the first West Indian to be officially published by British publishers, although it did take her a while to be published, as you'll see. Next slide. Um, her son said to me on email, in 1962, she compiled a booklet, Recipes of the Islands for Robert Manufacturing Company, to promote their new glow spread margarine product. Rita Springer was the original Mrs. Cookit on a food and nutrition radio program sponsored by Supercenter Limited, and she taught at the Housecraft Center. In Rita's own words, I, I cite this, she'd gone to the UK and she took with her a large collection of recipes and some books. She decided she wanted to write a cookbook. And she tested the recipes while she's in the UK and she wrote a few chapters and sent them to publishers. Note, three publishing companies, Andre Dush, Macmillan, Collins, interviewed me. All of them decided against the risk of publishing a West Indian cookbook. Eventually, she is published by Evans Brothers. And you can see the various places the books were sold, in Canada, America, the Caribbean, the highest sales achieved in Jamaica and Barbados, New Zealand, Australia, and a few of the African countries. And her book has been republished as I said, the most recent edition is 2007. Privilege, we've seen the privilege, the dish of privilege. Um, Errol Walton Barrow and Mr. Lee published after his death, but the collection was there. Now we come to homestyle recipes from cooks in Barbados. And I include this really because it's the first time I saw microwave in a cookbook. Microwave cuckoo, microwave fish, microwave pigeon peas and rice, microwave plantains. Cuckoo freezes well. Four in microwave. <laughs> so there are many cookbooks, many cookbooks. But I want, this shows you there's a 21st century is upon us. And mo how many of you in here have used microwave cuckoo or cooked microwave cuckoo? Anyone? A few hands up. Successfully? Yes, successful. Because it's interesting, someone giving a lecture akin to this in 20 years, they'll be speaking of the ancient way of stirring with a cuckoo stick. <laughs> you never know. Um, I, however, do have a query of the authors. This is included. Cuckoo is not, as many Barbadians call it, cuckoo, as in cuckoo clock or cuckoo bird. The correct pronunciation is cuckoo. Use of other dishes such as green banana or breadfruit, cuckoo simply means mashed, after the manner of mashed potatoes, which Barbadians call cream potatoes. Ah, uh, not really. Certainly, um, pong, I'm wondering if you're thinking of fufu, the pong yam or pong plantain. The mash, we think of breadfruit, but when it comes to cornmeal cuckoo, you wouldn't necessarily say mash. So I've included an excerpt from Castle of My Skin. The last pages of Castle of My Skin, Lamin devotes to talking about his mother's farewell to him, and she opted to cook him a dish of cuckoo and flying fish. I had seen her sitting, sifting the corn flour, and it seemed a very tedious undertaking. It was a yellow powder, almost fine as dust. The water boiled, and she added the okras, which had been cut into thin, round slices. When the okras had been thrown into the pot, the water quickly became a thick boiling slime. From now on, the mixture took the form of a vigorous stirring, so not mash. Occasionally, she threw in the water to moisten the mixture. The stirring went on till the mixture in the pot turned soft and without resistance to the cut of the cuckoo stick across the surface. She added the remainder of the slime and left the food simmering in the pot. So the stirring and simmering action. Again, that taxonomy of cooking that Maureen Warner Lewis speaks to. She filled the half calabash and shook it sideways before turning the mixture on the plate. The steam rose in a thick pile from the calabash. The calabash had given it a smooth, even curve all round. It was like a visitor waiting to be shown in. <laughs> Beautiful, and, and it continues, it continues. He's on his way to Trinidad, and she, he, he begins the passage with her asking, you, they know how to make cuckoo down there? <laughs> and then on and on he goes, a beautiful tribute to cuckoo. 
We come to Carmita Fraser. This is the, ver the Carmita that many of us will remember, the younger version, no? I believe this is on the cover of Food Comes First, or Cooking the Bajan Way. I've selected just a few because I'm aware of the time. Many, many recipes for golden apples. Many recipes of yam, and remember Cuckoo was pioneering the instant yam. And the local fruit drinks. I've had someone say to me that they have tried the cherry kulma, um, golden apple beer, sweet potato beverage, um, kind of bringing back the 17th century of sweet potato being used as drink. And the tamarind ginger punch sounds delightful. Very, very kamita, yes. And the seasoning for pepper pot, um, eight peppercorns, four large peppers, and six hot, small hot peppers tied in muslin. Pepper underlying pot. And I thought I would bring Austin in here again uh, on a reflection of his mother. These are the concluding pages of his book, Pigtails and Breadfruit. He's apparently making an African chicken and his brothers are there and they're all grown men. And his mother is talking to him and saying, well, you're not doing it the correct way. And the, and the men aren't saying anything. They're sniggering because Austin is the one doing the stirring. But no one wants to disrespect her. But she scolds. Why you don't rub some more lime juice on the chicken to take away the freshness? Why you don't pour on a little more salt? Who are you cooking for, though? For people that are suffering from depression? Boy, season the chicken good, do. <laughs> and that aspect of seasoning is part of Bajan and Caribbean cuisine. So I, I wanted to bring that to show another thing. Yes. I'm aware of time. Now, is black pudding still in the pot? Has anyone eaten black pudding recently? In the, in the skin, in the, in the intestine. I've had about three hands, four hands, five, six, seven, eight. Okay, so it's still in the pot, but not as popular as before? Not as popular as before. Um, but this was... This was an every weekend activity for any lady or gent preparing pudding and sauce, and these instructions would be very, very um, knowledge. They would know of the instructions. We now of a later generation might stare and think intestines, yes. And strained pig's blood mixed with water, black pudding. There's a theory that the Rastafari kind of jolted us into thinking about healthy foods. Um, not to mention, as we all know, if you were someone who sold pudding and sauce and one individual gets ill, that's the end of your chef's space. But I thought black pudding had gone from the pot, but apparently it's still around. Thank you. And so I took the shot of Tony's in Wildy. It's a cook shop in Wildy. And every Friday and Saturday, he serves pudding and sauce. And that's his sign. It's only after as I realized there are two ice picks holding the sign. But hey, Bajan style. So today's special pudding and sauce, Bajan style. And individuals come and they stand in the weight. It's not in the intestine. And it's what you would call perhaps white pudding, breadfruit, pickled breadfruit, sauce. And the questions would be, you want the ear, the tongue, gristle, you want a little meat. Right, yeah, thank you. Enid Maxwell, I want to wrap up with Enid Maxwell, who's, if we're not careful, her legacy will be soon forgotten as well. Enid taught at the Housecraft Center. Can you go back? Yeah. So she taught at the Housecraft Center, and then she was principal of the Housecraft Center between 1966 and 1969, and she was invited back in 74 to an official opening. I'm not sure of that, what room that is that she's cut in the ribbon, but that's a young Enid with the students. This is the Enid that we came to know before she passed, the Enid of Atlantis. And I believe I'll ditch these, yes. Theo Williams, in an email communication, sent a piece of uh, an article that he'd written on Enid, so I'm quoting him. She believed that food was just not about nutrition, it was also about flavor, and that we had developed identifiable and distinctive Bajan flavors. She believed that we did not appreciate what we could do with what we could do with what we had right here, and that she could help to influence, and that she believed that she could help to influence our eating habits. She wanted to play a part, her part in the evolution of our culinary culture. And Sundays at Atlantis, Sunday meals at Atlantis. That 
was definitely, a, she did play a part. I'm aware of time, so I'll be wrapping up quickly with two quick points. Bruce St. John wrote a poem called Barbadian in Beijing. And Bruce was looking at, in the 1970s, issues of class and race, etc. So one of the questions when we say Beijing cuisine and Barbadian cuisine, we're still struggling as to how to identify what is Beijing. As I know, showed you in the beginning, the most current article that I could find on Barbadian cuisine gleefully omitted 300 years of history and the experiences of the majority of the country. So that's something we have to wrestle with. I also want to say that I'm very aware that I did not have the time to speak to the fast food culture that is the current of Barbadian cuisine, of Kentucky and Chefette, of the generations who do not know of, well, they know of South, but they would not have heard of turtle, and definitely generations who would never have eaten sea egg, for example. And perhaps we can have discussions of that in this period now. Thank you. <laughs>